So uh, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for coming so early. <laughs> and uh, now we're going to talk about the issue that's really driving this uh, industry, and that's technology. And we're going to learn uh, what's the current technologies that are coming online right now, and where is the future headed, and what are the issues that uh, you know, we're all facing. So let's start by uh, each one giving a short int introduction about yourself. Let's start with Andrew. Thanks, Avi. Uh, a, a quick thank you, as always, to Finance Magnets and Conversion Pros for putting together a great expo. We're very excited about the new venue. Uh, my name is Andrew Ralich. I'm CEO and co-founder of One Zero Financial Solutions. Uh, One Zero's been in the FX space for about seven and a half years now, uh, primarily providing connectivity solutions for retail brokers. We're quite well known for our MT4 bridging solutions, as well as aggregation and other connectivity technologies, enabling retail brokers to expand, differentiate, and grow their business. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Maur Lav. I'm a co-founder and COO at Panda Trading Systems. We are, in July, we're going to be 10 years in the business. We are a software provider, and we, are, we have two segments of activities. One is off-the-shelf solutions for existing Forex brokers, and we also provide complete solutions for binary option and Forex uh, trading solution. Good morning. Can you hear me? No. My name is Kobe Gour. I'm the CEO of Leverate, and Leverate provides full-scale solutions for brokers from the front-end systems to the back-end, which includes Meta and our own proprietary systems. It includes the risk management, liquidity, and basically everything a broker needs to run his business, for you, whether you're a newbie or a veteran, this is where you go to in order to get the, the systems that you need. Good morning. My name is Stanislav Efrimov, and I represent a broker called ICM Capital. Uh, this is a FCA-regulated broker. We provide uh, mainly liquidity, both retail and institutional liquidity for uh, retail clients, institutional clients. We have built-in ECN platform, and uh, I'm here probably to cover a little bit how brokers work with uh, the technology and uh, probably answer your questions. Uh, so do we have like uh, complexity in executing it? Why, don't, uh, why do we use or don't we use some other solutions in the world? And so on and so forth. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Fred Scaller. I'm the global head of sales at Forexware. Forexware has been around about four years now. We are the back-end technology that built FXDD uh, about four years ago. Senior management decided to monetize that investment and offer the technology out to the rest of the world. We process about 200,000 tickets a day. Uh, we have our own web trader. We offer white label solutions. We offer fixed API connectivity and full dealing desk solutions to more established brokers that are looking for risk management solutions. Uh, aggregation, price engine, we provide all the front end, back end tools that, that are needed. Hello, everyone. Is this working? Yeah. Uh, my name is Harpal Sandhu. I'm the CEO of Integral Development Corporation. So, Integral services banks, brokers, and investment managers, helping them grow their foreign exchange businesses. Um, we do this in essence by helping people understand their businesses more effectively design specific solutions to solve their problems and their customers' problems, deploy them in the cloud, and, uh, and run their businesses for them. We do this for about 200 institutions globally, uh, and in the margin FX space, uh, roughly 80 or so brokers uh, run uh, various aspects of their business on the interval uh, environment. Great, so a prestigious panel with a lot of experts in different fields. Um, let's start with our Paul. So what new technologies do you see coming online uh, in, in recent times? So, you know, the last year or so has been uh, interesting for the market. Uh, uh, so so I, I say, first of all, there are a number of micro markets that operate globally in the uh, leveraged FX space, or the margin FX space. And depending on where they are in the maturity cycle, either in terms of their understanding, their customers' understanding, or in the regulatory uh, uh, regime understanding, namely leverage ratios uh, uh, shifting. They're facing a different set of, of issues. Globally, on top of all of that, you've had the credit contraction issue that happened post-SMB. 
So given all of that, there are probably two or three pain points that are emerging that have then led to technology. So first is uh, alternative sources of credit to continue to access liquidity for hedging their books. So there's been quite a lot of work that has gone on for allowing people to uh, uh, manage credit either as a credit provider, so Prime of Prime infrastructure has been a big investment in the last year and a number of our partners, businesses have expanded significantly because of technology related to that. Second is um, uh, technology related to hedging more effectively. So the idea that <clears throat> uh, under certain regulatory environments where people, where, where regulators are asking uh, institutions to hedge more of their positions relative to the capital uh, that they have. Uh, it's a new world for some of them to have to hedge uh, quite large warehouses or books that they're running. Um, so much more sophisticated microstructures and networks to allow brokers to communicate uh, with the market, with each other, uh, and so on, have evolved. And those are, those are moving quite rapidly. So I think the two big areas. Fred? Yeah, we're, um, we're looking at some of the same issues as well. We're, uh, we've just built out a, a new order routing system so clients that come on board can really access the liquidity provided directly that they want to rather than seeing an aggregated stream. I know there's some people um, that are pushing this idea that you could be a prime of prime and really all they're offering you is a margin FX position. What we're doing is we're building out where you say, okay, I have four different liquidity providers and I want to see numbers one and three uh, for euro when I want to see numbers two and four for yen and sterling. Well, um, <clears throat> that's, what, that's what we're building out to. We have a web trader. We find that more and more people are looking for solutions other than MetaTrader and MT4. Um, we've just built out a bridge for MT5 that's going to allow futures, um, single stocks, all coming through the MT5 platform. And we think there's a, a lot of growth there. Stanislav. Well, uh, I believe uh, right now the competition is very tough for Forex brokers and uh, we can see that uh, spreads are really low and uh, probably like uh, just five years ago spread was uh, m maybe the uh, most advantage for brokers who could uh, beat the spread of others. But right now everyone uh, offers uh, very tight liquidity and we can see that uh, right now clients with uh, relatively small uh, deposits uh, have access to institutional liquidity with uh, really low spreads. So from a uh, broker's point of view, it becomes more and more uh, complicated to execute uh, that volume at such a low margin. And obviously, in order to maximize the profits from that flow, brokers have to invest in, in their own technology to not pay extra costs. This is number one. Number two is that uh, brokers need to invest in their own real-time risk management solutions to try to maximize profits. And uh, number three, I can see that right now uh, the world becomes more and more integrated. I mean, clients want to have access uh, not only to Forex trading, but they want to have access at the same time to CFD trading, where is stocks trading. And uh, I believe in the future we will see that a number of brokers around the world will have to provide unified solutions to allow clients to trade everything in one space? Well, I think that we as technology providers need to find, need to find a way or understand the, the problems or the issues that our brokers uh, have and, and, and support them or enable them to overcome them. As I see it, we have two major issues that our brokers face. First one is, is the regulation. Uh, I think it's actually an opportunity, not a, an issue. Uh, but the regulation are, is stricter, is, is uh, fiercer, and that creates one issue for, for the brokers, uh, which leads to the second issue. The competition is fiercer. Uh, both these issues lead to a much uh, lower margins, stronger uh, pressure on, on the bottom line. And I think that we as technology providers need to find the solutions for that. And uh, we at Leverett at least believe that the way to uh, solve this is to help our customers to optimize. They spend a lot of money on, on bringing traffic, trying to convert this traffic, trying to uh, retain these this, this traders in order to make their uh, top line bigger and the bottom line bigger. And the stronger the competition, uh, the bottom line get, gets lower. Uh, if we do the proper optimization through sophisticated uh, channels, through optimization of, of the funnels they have, 
through uh, technology that is called, it's quite uh, old in the market now, uh, big data, where you can actually personalize the approach to each one of your leads, to each one of your traders, to retain them properly, to approach, not everyone looks the same, uh, and personalize the approach and, and retain the traders, uh, we believe to, that we can bring a much better solution to our customers. I think Kobe is correct. I think if you're looking on trading platforms, at least on the retail side, the end users doesn't really care. They want the MT4, uh, that's for sure. But other than that, they don't really care today about the speed of execution, the edging capabilities. And I think uh, if I need to bet on it, I see the technology, the trend is going on the marketing and sales. Uh, for the last 10 years, we developed a CRM that is dedicated to the market. We see that, let's say, if a trader is trading on the gold, then when you go to the website, the broker will be able to retarget the same trader and give him a campaign specifically for the gold, for example. So I agree with Kobe that margins are becoming low. And in order to be competitive, brokers need to use technology in order to improve their marketing activities and the effectiveness of their call centers. Um, I think that will be the next trend. I, I think, Avi, when you introduced the panel, you, you said technology is, is what's driving the, the industry. And, and I think what we've heard is it's, it's actually very much the opposite. Uh, uh, all of us are, are reacting and, and adapting to an environment that's very much out of our control, uh, both regulatory changes and massive changes in the credit market over the last year since SMB has, have caused a lot of disruption in terms of how providers are accessing liquidity, accessing credit, um, and, and doing whatever they can to address a, an overall trend that I think I see as retail brokers needing to act more like institutional brokers. And, and that covers the, the technologies that they need to use to creatively access credit. That includes the margins that they're making on their business. The, the, the retail market is, is not as ripe as it used to be, and, and thus being creative about your marketing, being creative about what platforms you're offering is a necessity nowadays to retail brokers in the same way the institutional side of the industry has evolved before it. And so we're seeing a lot of demand from our clients in the retail space where we've kind of grown up with them over the last seven years to integrate and adapt tools that are more traditionally uh, institutional tools. Aggregation for retail brokers, the ability for retail brokers to provide and extend credit to each other is something that previously there was a, more than enough credit available from tier one PBs and, and the higher end of the market. And I think in the last year, we've seen a lot of chaos in that space and, and thus a lot of adaptation from technology providers. So uh, did you see because of the, let's say, withdrawal from the market of some prime brokers that um, the brokers are, are more willing to cooperate through you, through, through their provider in order to, to create a liquidity pool for everybody? Yeah, and, and cooperation is a great, a great word for it. I think uh, a, a trend that, that we're seeing and a term that we're starting to use a lot internally at 1.0 is, is ecosystem. Uh, whereas you know, there, there used to be enough margins and, and, and enough room in the spread to, to pay a bridge provider, to pay, pay an aggregation provider, uh, to, to, to have multiple liquidity options and, and try to manage a very broad set of, of uh, pricing relationships. Nowadays, what we're seeing is the benefit of working with a provider who can provide a, a full vertical stack within one ecosystem, we call it, cooperate to take liquidity from a broker using the same technology. There you benefit in cost. There you benefit in, in quality of connection, quality of support. And so that type of cooperation, though, though everybody up here is a, is a technology provider, the squeezing of margins d doesn't stop at the broker. It's there for us as well. And so working with brokers to find ways that realistically they can cut their costs by working within an ecosystem, by using technologies that can cooperate between the institutional and retail spaces is, is definitely very important. Uh, Arpal, may maybe you want to uh, build up on that. So what uh, liquidity offers and, and prime of prime offers can um, you know, technology providers help their, their clients uh, get in, in these times of uh, you know, tight margins? Yeah, I, di I, didn't, I didn't 
fully hear the question. What is the question? So how can, as a technology provider, how can you help your clients get uh, tighter uh, liquidity? So <clears throat> first off, Integral provides infrastructure to a number of service providers who actually solve that problem. So for example, I mean, our, our sponsors for this event have been great partners of Interval for, I don't know, seven or eight years now. And I mean, for example, Sukton acts as an incredibly powerful prime of prime into this market. So the ability to combine credit, margined or collateralized credit, together with liquidity, together with uh, settling services and various other things, uh, is the lifeblood of a lot of brokers' ability to hedge and, and access markets. So at our level, we're the underlying platform behind a number of the service providers who are directly providing that. So, but it extends a bit further because the, the vacuum that was created when the prime brokers exited the market was actually quite a bit greater than even the existing institutionally oriented brokers could do on their own in terms of stepping in and filling in the gap. So there are two levels to this now, two additional opportunities for downstream brokers. The first is to access liquidity from technology service providers uh, in, in an aggregation or a, uh, a network um, that wasn't previously available. So for many years as an aggregation provider, we would give people access to point-to-point to point-to-point -to -point liquidity within uh, the overall ecosystem. And that was sort of you know, state-of-the-art in 2008 or 2009. Uh, things have evolved quite a lot from there. And uh, you know, a debate in last year's session or two years ago session, and I'm glad, Andrew, you've come over to the vertically integrated stack version, um, is you know, the debate was, you know, can you work with 15 different vendors and technology providers uh, and, and you be the general contractor to organize all of those things. And Interval's position was <coughs> good, but it's a lot of work. Uh, whereas if you work with a technology service provider who will never be your competitor and who can actually give you a fully vertically integrated stack where you can then run your business under your own name and no one actually even knows who's running things underneath it, actually gives you a huge amount of power. So what we've done in the past year or so with technology is actually include uh, very, very flexible credit access, very, very flexible uh, liquidity access, all prepackaged now within the stack. So where years ago we were talking about aggregation, we were talking about you know, bridge technology and so on, it is a full service brokerage offering now, including liquidity, including credit, including all of the hosting. And really the last piece, the only thing that, for example, people wouldn't get uh, working with, with our service offering is the marketing hand, right? So the branding, the distribution, uh, you know, that's up to them. And 80% of that is MT4 these days. So I think it's a very different world now. If I could just jump in, I, I think what we've seen since the SNB event is um, the major prime brokers the Citibanks, the Deutsche Banks, um, the RBSs of the world have really cut back on credit. So what, when, when Citibank was offering their, their prime broker facility, they were talking about a dollar and a half, two dollars per million, back and forth. Now that's evolved down to a prime of prime, and the prime of primes are paying a double PB, they have their infrastructure behind it, so those costs have gone from a dollar fifty a million to, in some cases, five, eight, fifteen dollars. Somebody approached me last night and was talking about fifteen dollars a million for prime services. So the credit component has become so expensive that I think we're going full circle. I think we're going back to point-to-point -point, um, liquidity relationships that are managed centrally through a uh, a true um, hub. So you can have multiple point-to-point -point relationships, not going through a prime of prime, not going through a prime broker, but that's all managed centrally through your technology provider. And that's one of the things that we're working on. I just want to say we have 84 brokers in the network. I think that retail brokers today don't care about liquidity. Most of them are risk taker, they're doing B booking. If they want to edge, one or two of their clients that are using LMAX. I really think that from the platform providers and all the back end, the new brokers, the retail brokers, the brokers that are offering today binary options, <coughs> sorry, they don't care about what's going on in the background. And I think from a technology vendor, at least myself and Kobe, 
we'll see the vendors taking risk on behalf of the brokers. Uh, like in binary option, brokers will, they don't care about risk management, they just want to make sure that they're profitable according to a specific APIs. And I think, uh, I don't see a retail brokers doing an aggregation, for example. I don't think there is a need. I think today you have uh, liquidity providers that can give you best of price with a good enough liquidity, at least for retail tickets. I have to disagree there that, that That's okay. speed of execution is, is, is certainly a differentiator for retail brokers right now, 100%. But everybody is trading over the web. So you have the 5% that are doing the EA on VPS next to the server of the broker, but it's such a small segment. So for a well-established broker, those 5% of traders represent a large majority of deposits and thus a large majority of volume. So for, for the institutional brokers we're working with, it, it, the speed of execution. I agree that aggregation is, is something that is, is difficult in the retail space, especially without a, a, an abundance of, of available tier one prime brokerage and central clearing right now. But, but I still think uh, quality of execution, quality of risk management as well, I, I do think is an important tool that we're seeing brokers ask for. The internalization is another answer to a credit crunch. If you if hedging out trades, I think the, the dream of the the riskless STP model went away in, in a cloud of smoke last year when, when FXCM running a no dealing desk model was one of the biggest victims of, of the SMB crisis. So but if, but if even I, before, if you look on the STP brokers, they were unprofitable if you're comparing them with the B book. So I think when someone sees that you have, and I think, Kobe, you have a lot of clients that are doing B booking and A booking. The STP model is only if you're not able or you don't want to take the risk on specific trader. I From an industry perspective, it's much profitable to be a market maker. I, I fully agree with Mo, with Mo on, on that. Customers, our customers, uh, 150 of them, uh, because of the margins getting tighter and lower, willing to take more risks and, and the ability or, or their importance of uh, finding the uh, risk management and the edging and the liquidity, is much lower than used to see in the past. And I think that for at least for the retail space, uh, this uh, part of, of mar lower margins, taking more risk will take the liquidity part uh, even to lower scale on that. I think right now it's about 85, 15. But, but are these brokers capitalized to take the risk? As you mentioned in your intro, that regulatory is one of the biggest threats that you're seeing from your client base. So yeah, they don't think will so that risk taking be allowed? It's part of, of the way they're doing business, all of them, will, Many of them are regulated and adhere to the regulation, especially on this part. Uh, the pressure will continue to uh, come, but I think right now the regulators do not operate in the space of the liquidity. They operate more on the parts of uh, making sure that the <coughs> trader funds and the KYC and the protection on the trader is much more valuable to, or important to them than this part of the business. Frank? Last year, um, the end of last year, I had a conversation with one of our larger broker clients and he was talking, we were talking about just about this subject, about holding more of what FXCM went through as opposed to all of the B-book brokers who didn't. And, you know, coming from New York, he said, um, he said, this is the Atlantic City model. You know, we're the house. And uh, I reminded him that four casinos closed in Atlantic City over the last year, you know. And I think everybody's very comfortable in the fact that you could take risk, you could take risk, you could pile it on until you have an event that you can't. And the point that Andrew brings up is the haircuts that the regulators are asking for to hold this large amount of risk is unsustainable. I mean, it's, it, you can't continue to the set it and forget it model. You need a lot more sophistication in how you manage that risk. You know, well, uh, sorry, let me uh, tell from a uh, broker's point of view. Uh, well, first of all, uh, speaking about ourselves and speaking about our friends and maybe partners, I can see that uh, if a broker reaches a certain level, I mean, for example, at least 10 yards or, uh, per month volume, it becomes more and more risky for them to uh, include, uh, to execute everything internally. And uh, if you have just maybe two clients with deposits of 10 mil, you cannot longer provide them with uh, one to 500 leverage and you need to find a way how to properly execute their volume. So I, I, I would agree with Andrew uh, that right now, after SNB especially, uh, brokers have to find ways how to properly execute that volume. I don't mean that uh, uh, they generally need to use book A volume, uh, book A mode or book B mode, 
Uh, actually, uh, right now I can see that more and more brokers work on so-called uh, book C mode, which is like quant execution of uh, their volume. So they, in order to optimize uh, the profits based on low margin, you definitely need to have access to institutional liquidity. You definitely need to have access to back-to-back -back margin if required. You definitely need to uh, understand how to execute this or that specific client. And I can also say that uh, from broker's point of view, uh, uh, right now it becomes very, uh, uh, you need to understand how to properly execute the client. Like, uh, is it, uh, you need to provide uh, very customized liquidity for HFT clients, let's say, or to clients who trade bigger chunks per click. So, and uh, it, it's up to your internal technology. Do you have this internal technology which provides you access to individual pools for clients? Can you really do this? Uh, are they happy with your execution? So this is the way how you can compete in modern world. So I think this, this conversation about risk, though, might be at slightly cross purposes. Um, you know, there, there are many types of risks associated with running a brokerage operation. And the issue that happened with FXCM as an SDP broker, when there was a, um, a two or, or five standard deviation event in terms of a price movement, had to do with credit risk their customers, um, you know, not being collateralized enough. So that was the leverage they were giving to customers. That was credit risk. The issue about how one manages their warehouse or their B-book uh, with the market or not is an issue of market risk. Um, and I don't think any of us up here actually will ever be in a position to dictate to brokers what their risk utility is going to look like and how they want to manage risk. And there is a never-ending scale across the spectrum. We can talk about the influences. Some people want to manage risk in a particular way because they believe risk-adjusted, they will be more profitable in a certain model if margins are tight, and that's their prerogative to do that. Other people will believe that risk-adjusted, they're much better, you know, A-booking it uh, because they won't take any market risk, and that's their prerogative to do that. So uh, as a technology vendor, we don't take any view about what is the right answer for a broker as to which risks they should take and how they should manage them. What we do say, however, is that if you're going to make a decision about how to manage your respective risks, you have to have the data about what, those, what the characteristics of your order flow actually look like so you can assess what risks you want to take. Uh, you have to have the big data analysis. You have to have uh, the tools to continue to monitor and manage that, and then to make the policy decisions that you would make about how you'd want to manage that risk. So we spend a huge amount of capital uh, building up infrastructure for big data um, uh, databases themselves. I mean, upwards of 1.3 terabytes of data a day we capture across all of our customers and process that data to give people the baseline uh, that they use to then analyze their customer or profile their customer order flow for figuring out what they do about market risk. And then on the credit risk side, uh, there are some really important issues there about the volatility of the underlying um, uh, products that they're trading and uh, you know, what happened in SMB. And I I'll tell you one interesting point on this. If the U.S. Federal Reserve does begin their process, their liftoff, which was sort of aborted earlier this year, of raising U.S. interest rates. There are another half dozen currency pairs that are semi-pegged to the U.S. dollar whose economies cannot handle actually increasing their rates, in which case those pegs will, will, will have an increased strain placed on them over the next six months to a year, and they will eventually decouple. And when they decouple, you're going to have exactly another series of SNB events. But that is a credit risk issue about how much leverage you're giving to your customers. And so our view is we have very smart people out here that run great businesses. They take all kinds of risks. We should give them, and we do give them, the data and the tools to, to analyze, assess, monitor, and then manage those risks. And if they can do that, then it's their call. Stanislav, I want to ask you as a broker, do you use any technologies in order to mitigate your risk, like identifying toxic flow, you know, um, traders you think are uh, inappropriate for your risk model, or even um, you know, a, a technology that's going to tell you you, know, you have too much exposure to the, you know, Saudi Riyadh you know, in case of a, a decoupling, you, know, you, you might get you know, hurt more than, uh, than, you're, than you're willing to, to risk. Is that, some, is that a technology that, that brokers do use, do look at? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we, we actually invested in our um, real-time risk monitoring uh, tool. 
and uh, we are able to, uh, to control all sorts of, uh, okay, maybe not all sorts, but uh, risks which are very important to us, including credit risks, including uh, uh, big market exposure, and uh, we try to maximize once again our profits out of it. So it's not uh, just you need to uh, uh, onboard, uh, internalize all the risks, and leave it forever, or like for a week, the, in, in hopes that the market will move against the client. So you need to actually uh, have very professional dealing team, first of all, very professional risk management team, and you need to provide them with uh, uh, real-time monitoring tools so they can control the market. I totally agree here, and I think it's a bit, it's one step more than real-time real monitoring. Uh, you can't monitor hundreds of thousands of trades per hour. So you need to have a system, and this is one of the systems that Leverett has, it's called the uh, LXRISC, that actually gives you some kind, to simplify this, a rule engine, that basically can tell you to the level of trader, a trade, a position, an instrument, what you as a dealer, a chief dealer, can do, or wants the system to do. So you can pinpoint to a level that actually, a specific trader from a specific location that trades on that instrument with that amount, uh, can go to an A book, or uh, different other uh, different uh, trades will go to B book, and I think once you give this information, once you give this uh, big data ability, but also the rules to follow to manage your risk, that's the best tool for brokers to basically decide. Because oh, uh, eventually, and honestly, I don't think there's one that is totally A book and one that is totally B book. So everyone is somewhere in, in the scale, and once they do that, they need to have such a system. Yeah, I actually think that uh, everyone? Sorry, a modern uh, risk monitoring, uh, real-time risk monitoring tools, they not only need to uh, have a setup that, okay, for that specific client, that specific uh, security, we need to execute an A mode, uh, that specific security and B mode. Uh, so it needs to be right now even more complicated. So you need to uh, monitor uh, both uh, uh, your internal uh, risks for individual clients, individual securities. Also, you need to monitor overall risks for the company, overall exposure for the company. Also, you need to monitor uh, your uh, something which you executed with your liquidity providers, with institutional uh, li liquidity providers. So these are all the things which must be included in the real-time risk monitoring system. And uh, it becomes more complicated that uh, second pair that that client will execute in A mode, that client will execute in B mode. So uh, it must execute it based on the current uh, market volatility, based on the exposure to the market, based on uh, the uh, once again exposure which you have with institutional brokers. I, th I think th I think all the comments here match the trend of uh, institutional concepts trickling down into retail. The, the, the traditional model of, of my STP liquidity isn't that important because I'm going to book 90% of my business blindly. A, a good proportion of them are going to lose and my equity is going to be up and theirs is going to be down at the end of the month. It is over. And, and the type of risk management that Stas is describing, that, that Harpal is describing with, with big data, is what the major banks have been doing at the top end of this industry for years. You know, every retail bro broker knows what a dealer is. Uh, every retail broker knows what a back office is. And, Retail brokers are going to have to learn what a quant is. Uh, you know, the, the person drilling down into that data, the tools that they use, something we've been investing in through a partnership with a company called Tapas over the last year, it, uh, are all essential parts of being a retail broker now. It, it, it's not, just like you guys have said, it's not putting clients in one bucket and another bucket and being happy and when these guys make money, move them over. It, it, it's a very sophisticated analysis that requires institutional quality tools. And, and, and the, you know, the question that we continue to ask at One Zero is, are the providers that, that were born in retail and that have catered to these, these type of brokers for a while going to reach up and pull this institutional functionality down? Or are the providers who, who began in the institutional space, which we've identified has changed a lot, going to be able to adapt their way of working their pricing and their margins to directly engage retail brokers. And I think that's a very interesting trend we'll be watching over the next two years. Last nice comment, Fred. I've spent uh, over 30 years at major banks trading and just moved over to the retail side probably eight years ago. And I was fascinated at some of the tools that are available to retail brokers that major banks use. And the idea of skewing, 
you know, where, where you could see a spread and say, okay, my spread is uh, 0.5 aside, this is my markup. And as the market moves higher, well, we give people the ability to skew. So now you're not making any profit on the bid side if the market's going higher, but you're making a full pip on the offer side without changing the spread to the end user client. That's something that the banks have been using for, for years and years and years. That's how they offload their, <clears throat> their positions. That's how they become more aggressive on the bid side or the offer side. And we're giving those tools to brokers, um, plus so many others, the idea of different buckets, how you can put different currency buckets and say, when I reach this limit, um, I want everything to move to, to the B book, or I want to uh, liquidate the positions when the bucket gets too large. Those are things that the banks have been employing for a while, and we have those tools at Forexware for our enterprise solution. Okay, um, it's an interesting talk, uh, interesting subject that won't be solved here. Um, next uh, subject uh, I want to touch upon is uh, who leads who? Does um, the technology providers see their role as pushing brokers into using new technologies, or are you, you know, pulled by the brokers demanding uh, new stuff? This, you know, what uh, Andrew in here uh, and, and me talked about, but also uh, Maor mentioned, like, uh, right now you're saying everybody just wants their MT4 and most of the development is on the, on the back, on, on the marketing. No, just MT4 is like an engine. Everybody wants a car. They want to have the set of tools to allow them to operate as a broker. Uh, the MT4 is a great engine. There are also other engines, and I think the trend will also be, I think we'll see brokers offering multiple platforms, uh, as Andrew predicted last year. And I think that brokers don't care about risk management, really, at least most of the retail brokers. Now, when we look ahead, it really depends who are the provider. I think that Leverett and Panda, we are market leaders. We are taking people that want to invest and become a brokerage, and we're actually training them how to manage their brokerage. So if we'll give them a, ma a better tool, let's say, to manage the risk, that will be their standard and that, uh, the tool that they will use. More sophisticated brokers that are using companies like One Zero and Integral, I believe that they know exactly what they want and they are leading the vendors. But for retail brokers that are starting, it's really up to us, the technology vendors, to create a benchmark, to create a standard for what kind of technology they're using. Because let's say tomorrow I'm coming to them and telling them, listen, I don't have a risk management tool. They will leave me, but they, they will not use a, technology, a risk management tool. So I think that we are a technology provider we are actually leading the market. Of course, we are very connected with the client's demands. Otherwise, we can survive. I think it's a combination. and It's always um, shift, the, the needle is shifting all the time. Um, on one hand, yeah, as a technology provider and as a leader one in that market, you always need to anticipate where the market goes. Now, one thing that I mentioned in many such panels is that the forex industry, especially the retail one, is, is behind the gaming world in many aspects when it comes to technology adoption in about five to seven years. So if you want to see where the Forex, retail Forex will be in five, seven years from now, look at the gaming where they are right now in terms of marketing, in terms of uh, uh, doing the best with the assets they have. And you see a lot of things coming from the gaming into that space. Uh, and, and for me as a veteran of the gaming, it's, it's really easy. I've been there, I've, I've saw some of the things uh, even implemented some of them. So this is, these are things that we're trying to lead the market to, and we know it, it will come. Uh, the second part is that we are working with, with some of the bigger brokers in the market, and eventually sitting with them is also understanding their pain points, their thoughts about their future and where they want to go, and uh, it's kind of a bi-directional uh, discussions on, on things that they request from us, and we say, hey, these guys are right, so it's kind of, we have so many brokers and so many of the big ones that it kind of gives us the pretty good picture of, of where the retail forex space is going. So this is why I think it's at the end of the day, it's a combination. And Stanislav, as, as a broker, how do, you, how do you see this relationship? Do you go to your technology providers and say, I, I need uh, a certain technology to, to fill this demand, or, do you, or are you approached and offer new technologies and examine the first? Well, I would say that uh, it's uh, totally understandable that new brokers uh, enter that world and uh, they tend to use 
uh, ready solutions like uh, our partners provide. And uh, originally, when, uh, uh, while they grow up, once again, while they uh, execute in like smaller amounts, amounts, they can internalize all the risks, use uh, ready to have like ready to use uh, solutions and start that business. But when they reach certain level, uh, when they reach, uh, uh, when they become bigger, as they once again tend to invest more and more in their own technologies. They first of all needed to minimize their own costs. So, uh, and I'm talking about both uh, breach related costs, uh, CRM related costs, and so on. And uh, also they, uh, uh, this is the only way for broker to compete in the current world with so, uh, so low spread, so low margins. So it's, you need to minimize all the technology costs once again, when you reach certain level. So you have to invest, unfortunately, it's, uh, it's very obviously expensive an, uh, investment, but you need to invest more and more in your own technologies and your own development. I think it's very difficult for a technology provider to sell their idea of what the market needs. I think the market has to tell us, uh, whether it be the brokers, but the market as a whole, what we just talked about is the, uh, the, the credit issue that's created a lot of uh, the, the the solutions that we've come up with here. You know, it's, it's like the, the inventor of the Segway. A great product, great tool, but nobody uses it, you know? It's trying, trying a, a solution for a problem that doesn't exist. And what we're trying to do is address problems that do exist. So I think it really comes from the market, and that's what we try to solve those problems. Well, coming from Silicon Valley, I have to argue that we innovate and we come up with things, and although the Segway didn't work, at least the guy tried, uh, when the iPhone came out, it did work. So there are plenty of examples where technology companies absolutely understand the pain points of the customer, understand the needs of the customer, but don't blindly just follow what the customer is saying they explicitly want, and then point for point just adding functions and features. I mean, any consulting or services firm could do that. And by the way, it's not a bad business. There are plenty of people who do that and plenty of technology vendors who will do what you tell them to do, some case on time and materials, in some case they'll build a product. But that's not going to make you, that's not a leading technology company and that's not going to make you a leading broker. Uh, you lead by understanding what the market wants and what the market needs, and then innovating and coming up with creative solutions that solve the problems in the market in ways that haven't been done before. And great companies that do that grow really well and build fantastic products and are really proud of what they accomplished. And so it's both. Uh, but yeah, if you're a technology company, if you're a leader, you're leading. If you're a follower, you're following your customers. Uh, we, I mean, we, we're a leader, so we, we build stuff. Andrew, how, how do you see yourself as an educator? Yeah, I, I agree 100% with what, what Harpal said. I think it's, it, it's a combination. Um, it's a cooperation and, and uh, a work between the broker and the technology provider. To, to put it bluntly, to understand what the role is as an organization. Uh, I, I, Stas, you, you, your company, which, which I, I, I am very familiar with, is a, is a rare case in this industry where an entity has proven to be both proficient in marketing, risk management, and building technology. And, and I can tell you, I wake up every morning with, with plenty of challenges to deal with, and I'm so happy that one of them isn't really caring where the market is, isn't managing risk. That's not our expertise at One Zero. And, and for, for many of the technology companies up here, we've learned to work with brokers. We've learned to encourage them to see where our expertise in technology, understanding big data, understanding what tools and innovations are available to brokers, and then helping adapt them to problems that are presented by the industry, by brokers directly to us. So it's a cooperation. In a vacuum, in a closed room, could we come up with solutions that address what this market needs? Absolutely not. You, you need to cooperate. You need to take input from the brokers. But as Harpel said, that there are experts in managing risk, there are experts in marketing, and there are experts in technology. And, and you have a, a unicorn of a company if, if you feel that you've mastered all three of those at once. And, if, if, if you're a great marketed and, and great risk managed firm and you're thinking about getting into development it, with some bias, of course, on the technology panel, I, I'd encourage you to look at the, the differences 
that exists between running a technology organization and running a brokerage. Jason, do we have time one last question? Or? Sure. So uh, our, our time ran out, so let, let's keep it brief, but just everyone say uh, what technology do you see uh, coming in the next three to ten years, whether it's from gaming or uh, the institutional side that, uh, you know, going to be adapted by, by Rita? Let's, let's start with Andrew. You know, we, we look at the, the direction of the industry as a spectrum. You know, on one side, every broker is an insulated B-book who manages their own risk and only passes out uh, trades that they feel that they, they can't handle. Uh, on the other side, and, and what's discussed at a lot of P&L or FX Week conferences, is the whole industry is one big transparent exchange where everybody's trades go into one pool. Um, I think over the next two years, you're, you're going to see an interesting balance with brokers juggling the challenges of managing risk, increasing their margins by taking on more institutional style processes within their firms, and at the same time adapting their liquidity solutions, building out more interesting, uh, more contemporary pools of liquidity through which they can exchange and uh, address credit issues. So I think, uh, let's say 10 years, I'm not able to see this far. But let's say in the next uh, year or two, I think the focus will be on marketing, to be able to engage with the client, to have some kind of emotional connection with the client using the mobile apps while he trade, while he think he's about to trade. That will be the next trend. And I think, bottom line, yes, risk management is important. It's a survival tool for a broker. But if we want to increase the margins, we need, we need to increase the marketing. And at the end of the day, as technology providers, most of us have a model that tied ourselves to the profits of the broker, if it's a rev share or if it's a volume based. And I think the tools on the marketing will make the change. And it's a race. I think the gaming industry are three years ahead of us. And for our, the technology side, it's a race who will become more sophisticated on the marketing and will be able to increase the lifetime value of the trader. Uh, for sure, that will be the next big thing for the next one or two years. I agree. As I said, uh, optimization, I think, would be the name of the game. And, you, and for us as technology provider, using tools and technology that already exist uh, is going to be there, or it's already there, like big data. But big data is it's just a foundation. So we need to do, know what to do with this. And the way to do something with this is, is through uh, understanding proactively who's the trader in front of you. Starting from the point of acquisition, uh, right now everyone really experts in understanding the funnels and where the trader is coming from and how, how much uh, of the CPA I paid for this trader. But how many of, of the brokers really understand the conversion path and funnels? How many of them understand the retention? How many of, the, uh, of them think of a trader as an individual and not as a group? And I think the seg segmentation is kind of a group, but personalization is the secret. And any broker that will invest in marketing, as Mao mentioned, but personalized marketing, would be the one that will lead the market. And, and this can only happen through technology and big data and personalization and optimization. All the authorization exists. But at the end of the day, it's not about working as they used to work in the past, using smart or having the brain power to do it smarter. Uh, well, I believe uh, currently we can see that uh, competition in this uh, world becomes very, very aggressive. It, it concerns both brokers and it concerns, obviously, technology providers as well. And uh, I know for sure that uh, there are quite a number of brokers in the world who also decreased their spreads but didn't invest in their internal technologies and uh, basically their costs are at the same level as it was like two, three years ago. And obviously they cannot uh, compete in modern world so they are not profitable for years and uh, we will probably see uh, some companies unfortunately will disappear from this market in just three years time. Uh, that's, uh, that's because they cannot minimize their internal uh, technology costs and they cannot properly execute their volume. That's number one. But also we can see that uh, with modern uh, competing world, with modern technologies, we can see some uh, uh, long-term like uh, tendencies uh, which will affect the market in like three, ten years. Obviously it's a uh, well-known blockchain technology first of all. So I can see that Within like two, three years, for sure, we will uh, Im modify the current clearing world completely. So there will be no, 
no need to use on, in intermediate companies like Triana to settle uh, the trades. So that, that will first of all keep the cost of settlement very low and will help obviously prime brokers and prime of prime solutions to uh, also minimize their costs. Also with uh, this uh, block, blockchain technology, and most probably in 10 years, there will be no brokers working on the same model as we do now. So because clients will do uh, direct client to client match and they will not probably need a broker anymore. So it's uh, actually very, uh, well, first of all, maybe, uh, I, I, don't say, I don't say it's dangerous uh, right now, but in 10 years time, those brokers who cannot adapt to this, who cannot uh, involve this, uh, who cannot do like direct client to client match model internally, so they will also disappear. I think there's, uh, there's two issues that we look at. One is what Andrew brought up uh, a couple of minutes ago about the idea of analyzing data, bringing quants in that used to be in the banks. I think more and more retail brokers are going to focus on the data, look at it, dig down deep, find out how their clients are making money, why their clients are making money, how they're losing money, and how you can gain from it. The second point I think is going to be very important is compliance. The idea of MIFID II, the idea of EMIR reporting, uh, getting all this data back to the regulators. Uh, everybody wants to be regulated somewhere. So whether it's EMIR, whether it's in Australia, the regulators are becoming much, much more involved in your business. And we as providers, uh, technology solution providers, need to help you get that data back to the agencies and work it through. I think that's going to be a big focus in the next year or two. So if we had to project out three to five years, there are, I think, only a few constants that people um, can absolutely believe in. Competition will increase, margins will decrease, technology costs will significantly increase. So if you just add those up, uh, I think the barriers to entry to this market of a broker that wants to enter and build everything themselves from scratch will absolutely be prohibitive. And it happened in every single other industry you look at it, from airlines to telecom to banks on the retail side, et cetera, all follow exactly the same trend. Uh, so the biggest technology shift really will be is that core utilitarian functions to brokerage operations will run in the cloud. They will be run by service providers. And new brokers will enter this market at the snap of a finger with very, very little capital. Uh, and it will further increase the competitive forces. So I think it'll be unheard of in three to five years for any new broker to enter this market and not use the full technology stack from a cloud-based service provider. And I think it'll be increasingly difficult for existing brokers who are running their own operation to ever compete with those new guys.